Now the general the question of the general intellect is a that the term general intellect is something that you find in Marx. You find it in Marx. So when I when I offered this particular correlation in Genu, uh, uh, and because I had already you know said the same thing that I I said to you that Ambedkar in Marx or Buddha in, in Kathmandu is actually working as a propagandist, uh, competing with with communism, not against communism but competing with communism. Then one of my students and friends said, so by bringing general intellect from Marx, you are bringing Marx back through the back door. You know? So in a sense, you're, you're, you're trying to do something which Ambedkar wouldn't do because he's, he's actually you know, competing with communist concepts at that time, Marxism at that time. Well, that is something which, which uh, is a valid doubt. But to me, the point is, Ambedkar is not here, Marx is not here. We are here. So we are speaking in our own voices. Does using a Marxist concept make us completely fall into one side and not using it automatically lead to being on Ambedkar's side? Well, maybe all that is not so clear. So my, my view is we must work our thoughts in our own voices in our times and make combinations which are our combinations. If that leads to an effect of uh, bringing Marx to the back door, that is not intentional. That is a damage that I'm willing to, you know, uh, to take upon myself. But I'm not doing it in the name of Marxism or in the name of this or that. But I'm doing it as a possible combination to explore and discuss. So having said that, general intellect is a very interesting, though very briefly touched upon concept that Marx uses in a book that he, which is not a book book, so in an interesting textual comparison, Buddha and his Dhamma is a book in the fullest sense. The comparable Marxian text would be Capital, because it is the book in a way. But there's something Marx does before the Capital, which is called Grundriss. So if people who know German, and I don't, they will of course be able to tell us what it means in the very exact sense. But basically it seems to mean something like notes, notes, notebooks, notebooks. So these are notebooks. These are not, this is not a, the book. This is preparation towards the book. So in, in the notebooks of Grundrisse, Marx towards the very end, it's a, it's a huge work. So the, the, of course, capital is five times or 10 times bigger, but even the notes are copious. So towards the very end of these notes, he uh, speaks about something he calls general intellect. And he says something which is really intriguing. He says, General intellect is something like the organs of the brain. No, see, he's not saying brain is, is the organ of the human being. He's saying general intellect, so brain is something like the physiological organ of human beings. Something which, you know, supposedly biologically enables us to think. But he says the social organs of the brain. So he is now saying that the brain itself seems to be graft organs seem seem to be organs seemed to be grafted onto the physiological brain not grafted in the physical sense but socially injected socially grafted in other words how the brain is created historically so not the brain in the head but the brain as outside the brain as existing socially and historically and he calls it general intellect so, of course, one meaning of general intellect is very clear, that the general intellect is no one's private property. The general intellect is indeed not what in Indian context again and again we speak about and we must speak about it, which is the, 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 the mediocrity of the idea of, the, of merit. Yeah. Merit as a personal, <coughs> as, as, uh, in the educational domain, the, a personal superiority or someone, someone has some, some brain power more than someone else's brain power. That is not what Marx is talking about clearly. Marx is talking about something 
which is fundamentally universal. Not universal, not universal, but fundamentally common, general. But he's using the word intellect. So what is this general intellect which is not a personal attribute? Which, is, which cannot be measured by you know, IQ quotients and all kinds of statistical tests that we do through examinations and so on and so forth. Something else, which is historical and social. But Marx does not quite develop this. And there is one thing that Marx actually points towards within capitalism, and interestingly, it's a negative characterization. And some Italian thinkers have pointed this out. And what Marx says is, look, uh, in capitalism, this kind of general intellect is what? Is basically machinery. So if you have, let's say, a big factory, uh, you know, technology, in our times, computer, lots of computer program, it is produced by collective intellect. But at the same time, it is something fixed. It is something which is the pure scientific instrument through which our lives are being controlled by eventually not just that instrument, but its marketization, its capitalization. So in that sense, capitalism is a capture of the general intellect. And science, scientific achievements, those very things which in our times we call development are precisely the general intellect, but understood in the negative sense. So in our country, since particularly the last five, six years, the word development has been made into an absolute. That, you know, no politics, only development. Right? Now, what is development? In Marx's understanding of one kind, at least, development is the general intellect. But general intellect understood, again, to use a characterization I used earlier in the context of religion, general intellect has rigidified. General intellect, which has been stopped. So machinery is a kind of stopping. You say, oh, bullet train, general intellect. So bullet train is general intellect. India's greatness, that's general intellect. But it is also beyond bullet train, nothing else. No other, so no questioning of anything but the bullet train. So, yeah. so general intellect then becomes a fetish, an ideology. So Marx, in a sense, is writing something which seems to start off with a very strong positive possibility and immediately he cuts it down because he's talking about general intellect, general intellect in, capital, in capitalism. So certain Italian thinkers from the 1970s who have been reading Grundrisse in a new way, uh, who are called the auto autonomists, who are part of the history of communism but also broken with this Russia-centric uh, Stalin communism, but also taken a distance from Maoism, though they have been more responsive to Maoism, but taken a distance from that too. And they have developed a certain, what they call, anti-work, uh, anti fetishization of labor and capitalism and creating a new culture of autonomous thinking, autonomous intellectuality, something which is an intellectuality which is not merely appropriated and exploited, but a, a fundamental intellectuality. So it's very close to Mao. Mao also speaks of the people as intellectuals. It's also close to Gramsci. All men are intellectuals. But it's somewhat different also. Because with the Italian autonomous thinkers, this intellectuality <coughs> is already a kind of revolutionary force. This common intellectuality is not a nominal idea that all men think. No. They're saying the fact that all men think means something more, which is, to use a philosophical word, ontological, <coughs> that all human beings think collectively. So there is nothing like privacy of thinking. Thinking is not private. So they try to draw out something much larger than what, uh, what even Mao, though Mao was a very powerful thinker in this, in this slide, but it was more practical and programmatic. To, because <coughs> Mao was also interested in opening up a kind, of, a, a kind of collective popular education. And in doing that, he also did terribly wrong things. But that was his this, they are not saying this. They are openly philosophical, or ontological. They say, no, no, we, we do all that or not do it, that's a different thing, policy matter. But we must, must first recognize the fundamental intellectuality, which is transformative, revolutionary, in the human being, as a collective being, as a generic being. So in that sense, they use the general intellect. And to do this, of course, they read along with Marx, other European thinkers like Hannah Arendt. So they, they take a particular phrase from Hannah Arendt. They say general intellect is always 
uh, Anna Arendt used this, uses this phrase, in the presence of others, we are never alone, we are never isolated, we are never private, we are always in the presence of others. So general intellect is always in the presence of others. But one of those thinkers, uh, of the Italian thinkers, called uh, Paolo Varno, he uses the most interesting interpretative uh, image or um, uh, metaphor for uh, conveying the meaning of general intellect. He, call, uh, he uses a theatrical theater metaphor. And he says, general intellect is virtuosity. Not the virtuosity of the virtuoso. So here he's taking an example of music. So he's saying, it is not the the, the, the virtuosity of, say, a musician like, well, we'll have a discussion on Kumar Gandhar later, but say Kumar Gandhar who sings a particular bhajan from whoever, you know, Sokhamela. So it's not the, the virtuosity of Kumar Gandhar. It's not, he takes the example of Glenn Gould, the Glenn Gould, the great pianist. So it's not Glenn Gould's virtuosity the way he performs Bach. <coughs> he says Glenn Gould can perform, and Glenn Gould performed Bach in many ways over the lifetime over his lifetime. So Glenn Gould towards the end performed Bach with an infinite slowness. And he himself said that I discovered a new kind of sound in Bach when I performed it later. Earlier it was much more <coughs> rhythmic and fast. He said the, all this is true, but this is not fundamentally the meaning of virtuosity. It is the other way around. Because there is virtuosity, hence Glenn Gould can do this variation through his life. So in that sense, virtuosity, virtuosity is something which is, uh, which is a, they call it faculty. And interestingly, they correlate it with contemporary modes of labor. So uh, they use, or Paolo Varno in particular, he uses both the objective idea of a kind of collective intellect and the specific historical forms of labor in our times. And he says in, in post-Fordist globalized capital, Labor is not anymore individualized. So if you look at labor as performed in the you know, digital labor, in, 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 the, in the hospitality industry, and in several areas of life, several areas of work, what you find is labor is already collectivized. So for instance, if you're working on the computer, then you might be doing a specific thing, but everyone's working on the computer. So to that extent, the computer is a minimal and a rigidified degenerate image, still an image of a direct exploitation of the collective intellect. Rather than the old idea of a specialized worker who only works on one part of the machine, which is the assembly line. The individual specialized worker, the, which is, who is not a virtuous, who is in that sense an old actor from the Stanislavskian school. Anyway, I don't want to get into the theater metaphor too much, or some of you might get bored with that, but uh, but it is an interesting it is an interesting correlation from theater that he uses that the old actor is always specialized. The Stanislavskian actor cannot act, uh, you know, uh, uh, he is but not particularly good at singing and dancing. But the modern actor is not like the virtuoso is not like that. The virtuoso can do a little bit of singing, a little bit of dancing, and can make combinations. This is the most important thing: make combinations, configurations. So in that sense, the, and again, the point is, it is not that the empirical combinations which an ex-actor or ex-performer or ex-musician does. It is an inherent faculty, this combinability, if I may use this horrible, barbaric, wrong word. I don't think there is any such word, but let me still do it. This ability to combine, ability to make hybrids. The so general intellect is this ability of hybridization. So it seems to me, and this is the last part that I'm going to you know, finish with this, it seems to me that this part of um, uh, re the reading of Marx has some uh, interest, that we are talking of something which is a faculty, but it is not a faculty which is a, which is, which is a, 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 a delimited faculty. It is a general faculty. It is a faculty which comes with the very being of being human. In that sense, it is egalitarian. So general intellect in this reading is an egalitarian basis on which then you can analyze the, the very mobilization of egalitarian faculties for inegalitarian ex exploitative ends that capitalism does in with modern labor. That's what the Italian thinkers are saying, basically. But you see the paradox then? 
The paradox is that if capitalism is actually using the egalitarian basis of human society, human collectivity, for inegalitarian reasons, then they are on the edge. Because the moment human society realizes that fundamentally, ontologically we are equal, then they will reject capitalism as an idea. And this is the hope that the Italian thinkers, autonomous thinkers, they stake their whole thinking on. And which is that because capitalism has pushed human society to the edge where their fundamental faculty of collective intellect is now being exploited, at some point, human beings will, it will hit them and they will come together on the basis of that very collective intellect, egalitarian intellect, and go beyond capitalism. This is the kind of revolutionary hypothesis uh, that they posit. Now, what has this to do with the uh, Buddha and his Dhamma? Now, it seems to me that in Buddha and his Dhamma, it's a huge book with, with, with a particular structure which is entirely deceptively simple in terms of storytelling and prescriptions and marked out programmatically in numbers and so on and so forth. But there is a fundamental point that Ambedkar is making in Buddha and his Dhamma which is the point of parivraja. The whole book, in a sense, is a meditation. Though the first book is the, where, uh, is the one where it comes out most clearly, which is the meaning of parivraja. And he is saying that the meaning of parivraja must be freed from its, in that sense, its uh, habitual Buddhist history of reading, even of certain dogmatic reading, or a naive reading. And that's why when he tells the story of Siddhartha's Parivraja. He actually does something very close to what Brecht did, Bertolt Brecht did, when he wrote a whole speculative notes on Hamlet. Why did Hamlet do, or what was Hamlet's problem? And he said, no, it's, please don't bring it to psychology. You have to actually look at the situation of Denmark and Norway at that time. Border. It has something to do with borders. This is what Brecht said. It's something to do with borders. Something to do with Norway's prince coming into Denmark and the Denmark Springs not being able to handle this political crisis. And that's exactly what happens in Hamlet. Towards the end, Norway's prince, Frautenbras, comes and takes over Denmark. And Brecht says, that is how to understand Brecht, uh, Hamlet. Don't do it through the usual literary analysis of Hamlet's psychology and Hamlet's inwardness. This is what Ambedkar does in a way with, with Siddharth. He says, don't look at it through some inner conversion merely. Look at it through a problem. Siddharth faces a problem. And what is that problem? A problem of war. And a problem of war is not a problem in the mind. It happens in the world, in history. And what does a problem provoke you to do or force you to do? To take decision. Whether in that time or our times or any other time. If there is a problem of war, then you have to take a decision. Will I join the war? Will I be kind of, you know, like Mother Courage in Brecht? Pretend as if the war doesn't exist and just do what I'm supposed to do, make money. Because my children, I have to feed my children. Is that possible? No. After a point, you will, you know, victimize your own children. Because you have not taken a position on the war. Do I become a pacifist? Like in the 60s in America and other European countries, uh, the, during the Vietnam time, people became pacifists. Open pacifists, students in particular. So these are decisions to be taken. So, the point is, it responds to a problem, but it, it is not the problem of uh, the military. It is not the problem of, though, of course, it is a problem of military with Siddharth, because he has to actually, is part of that campaign. But he, in a sense, subtracts himself from the military establishment, the military technocratic establishment <coughs> of uh, Lumpini, of that whole uh, setup, of his own father's kingdom. He subtracts himself and takes up the position of a parivraja. So parivraja is brokenness. And it is literally brokenness. Means you, so that's why the theme of nomadism must come back. Nomadism is not just a romantic tendency of moving around. Nomadism is always a decision to cross a line or to go somewhere else. Nomadism is a specific becoming in the face of a real problem. This is what Siddharth does. He decides to become something, which is a nomad. And he says, to, by doing this, I will also partly also 
you know, solve the problem of patriotism against my own country? Am I becoming an anti-national so on? No. I'll do something which will make me step out of that particular sort of a bind that I've been put into. In that sense, there's also in Parivraja the response of the intellect which is to a problem but through intermediate tactical steps. So it is not an absolute decision. It is also a tactically created decision. In other words, there is intelligence. But intelligence itself is articulated at different levels. So I have always called Buddha and his Dhamma a book of intelligence. Even before making this correlation with general intellect. It is a book of intelligence. And intelligence is not simply uh, an absolute word or a measurable idea. Intelligence is tactical movement, a nomadism of thinking vis-a-vis -vis problems. And a problem is always specific. And in a way, the entire Buddha and Islam is a story of intelligence vis-a-vis -vis problems. And possible problems and the possible intelligence to adopt collectively. So if you, if you accept this kind of an overall characterization of the Buddha and his Dhamma, then at the end, you find that this idea of Parivraja as a nomadism, or as the moment which creates a nomadism, which is you move somewhere else, you cross a line, you move through a line or on a line, this meaning comes across in a very precise way in the lecture Marx Buddha, when Ambedkar says that with the problem with the Russian experiment with the state and so on of Marxism is that they use force. The state is an instrument of force. Now, it's a, it's a fascinating and complicated discussion. Is Ambedkar anti-state? That would be very strange because Ambedkar is probably the thinker who wanted to produce a neutral state in, through the Indian constitution which would then take away the corporate social units which is caste. So he always said, state must not be anyone's property. No caste must own the state. So we need to build, in that sense, a theory of the state which is autonomous from the caste, from caste. Because each caste is only a corporate being, a corporate social being, as anti-social social. State must go beyond that. So he went to the extent of saying that, you know, hum, uh, human rights, rights, fundamental rights, are a gift of the state. So it seems as if, oh, He's giving everything to the state. And isn't the state authoritarian? Isn't the state police? But he's doing it for a reason. Very specific reason. And states and minorities, if you read the other text, it comes up clearly. But that's not my topic today. On the other hand, when he's discussing Marx and Russia, he's clearly saying that Lenin, basically he's addressing Lenin. He's saying Lenin has pitched all his hopes on the state. You say dictatorship of the proletariat. Very good. But dictatorship of the proletariat is still the dictatorship of the state. <coughs> the proletariat can take over the state, but they can't change the nature of the state. So wouldn't, wouldn't that automatically make the proletariat equally a statist oppressive force? And once that happens, then wh what will happen? At some point, this contradiction will, will, will produce a breakdown in the state, and then what will happen? And he asks this question prophetically. That if this fails, and it is kind of failing, then what will happen to Russia? And he says it will lead to bloodshed. Exactly what happened after the fall of the Soviet Union led to ethnic strife, retrograde, identitarian, uh, clinging to identitarian uh, passions, and so on and so forth. Prophetically, Ambedkar says. Now, if all of this is going on, uh, then what is the alternative? Because after all, the the, the purpose of the proletariat state is a good purpose. That Ambedkar doesn't deny, which is to provide some kind of a egalitarian ground, civic ground, administrative ground for everyone. So land reform and so on and so forth. But he says the method, because he's, it's also expropriative. The kulaks, the kulaks are, yes, a terribly oppressive and old archaic force. But if you're going to forcefully take land away from the kulaks and kill them, then you've already unleashed the power of the state, which potentially is self-destructive and also destructive of democracy. So basically he's saying it's a question of democracy. And he makes a clear statement. He says Buddha is democratic, while Marxism doesn't seem to be sufficiently commensurable with democracy. But what is democracy? What is democracy? Is democracy 
administration, good administration, but still administration? He says, no, democracy is not government. Democracy is a kind of disposition. So let me quote at the very end what he says. He says that unlike force, with the Buddha, there comes a threshold, a point, when the mind is energized by the Buddha. And this mind is not my mind. He says it's the mind of the world. The mind of the world is energized by the Buddha. And when the mind of the world is energized by the Buddha, then it doesn't require something like an organ from the outside like the state to inject that particular, that particular policy or that particular program. It happens as a disposition, as a collective disposition. So it is not a personal, uh, it's not a personal influence that he's talking about. It's not a personal, uh, you know, like, like a guru who, it's, so it's not like bhakti, where there's a kind of everyone is personally affected and yet since everyone is personally affected, a bhakti movement in a sense is created. Though everyone is in a sense in a stupor because of the bhakti as a rasa. He said, no, it's not like that. It is collective. It is the mind of the world. So it is not a mind outside. It is not a soul. It is not a property. It is not a metaphysical idea. And yet he doesn't really explain it beyond that. He says that the mind of the world that is energized by the Buddha. And in that energizing by the Buddha, the mind of the world is, is converted. So that's what he says. That Buddha is fundamentally conversion. Buddha is nothing but conversion. Conversion is parivraja. So you see, you get two very interesting correlated and yet different meanings of parivraja. Parivraja is the brokenness that is produced by history. And at the same time, parivraja is the conversion which also overcomes the problem of history through, to, through a new synthesis, a new form of life, a new disposition, which the communists are trying to bring in through something like the state according to me. And to him, that is, that is external. So one possible hypothesis of understanding the mind of the world is, the mind of the world is something like the general intellect. Because the mind of the world is not a transcendental uh, space. It is not a soul. It is not God. It is worldly. And at the same time, the mind of the world is something which is open to change. So it seems to me that uh, one possible hypothesis for the mind of the, for what the mind of the world might be uh, could be that it is uh, something which can be articulated with the notion of the general intellect as a kind of historical mind, as a kind of socially created, like I said, a social brain, a social mind. And I don't think Ambedkar would quarrel with that because Ambedkar again and again spoke of the social gospel. But of course, at the very end, we must remember that the problem is not solved or while the problems are being solved, new problems are arising. So the problem that I want to you know, end this discussion with is that how to ever demonstrate such a general intellect or such a collective faculty without the event of something new. So you see, there's a circle here, which seems to be a difficulty with Italian thinkers and the reading of Marx. Marx was at least clear that the general intellect is always something which is a force being uh, used and expropriated in particular societies. So capitalism <coughs> is something which uses the general intellect in, in a particular way and exploits it. But to make it a positive ontological attribute, which is it is a collective faculty, again means that I'm begging the question, where does that faculty exist? If, I'm, if I retain the minimal Ambedkarat parameter of reason, then I need to ask, please show me that faculty. Of course, they try to show you. They say, and this is the part which gets very, very strange. 
The Italian thinkers say, and Marx never spoke of it like that. It's a reading of Marx, beyond Marx. And they say that this particular faculty actually exists biologically. So you see, you started out with an abandonment of biology, but you ended up by, in biology. Why? Because they say human beings are created in such a way that they need a collective compensatory mechanism to compensate for their premature birth. All human beings are born prematurely, unlike other animals who adapt very closely because they have guided instincts, they have specific instincts. Human beings have no instincts, that is specific instincts, unlike an animal which actually, actually when it faces a predator, immediately instinctively knows what to do with the predator. Human beings do not have that. Human beings do not have environments in the strict sense. Hence, human beings have compensations. One of the compensations that human beings uh, possess, and that in a way is the proof of a general intellect, is language faculty. So they pitch a lot of hope on the language faculty. So this virtuosity is basically language. Then it becomes language of performance, language of music, language of whatever, but eventually it is language, the language faculty. So in that sense, Buddha then becomes, if you want to correlate it back to Ambedkar, Buddha then becomes a kind of faculty. But the paradox is, and that is highly both, it seems to me, anti-Ambedkarite and anti-materialist thinking of Marx, that it takes away from the birth of Buddha, it takes away the thought of Buddha as a historical thought. This is the problem. Because Buddha himself must arise out of a problem. But instead of that, uh, the, 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 the uh, excessively affirmative and somewhat poetic and somewhat almost mystical reading of the general intellect of the Italian Marxists leads this concept of the general intellect to become something superior to history. And what is superior to history seems to be the weak biology of human beings. So weakness is superior. That is a paradox, it seems to me, which can be very uh, systematically unmasked and, you know, at least partly dispelled by a thinking of the Buddha and his Dhamma and uh, Ambedkar's reading uh, of these questions in his own context. And the context is a very complex one, like I said, in the 1956 lecture uh, in Kathmandu, Marx, Buddha, or and is not an issue for me at all, because a lot of people make a lot of, you know, issue out of whether it's or or and because he didn't give it a title. But for me, it's not an issue. So that much. Thank you very much.